hemostasis. As far as definition is concerned, a sequence of events leading to cessation of bleeding by the formation of a stable fibrin thrombin hemostatic plug. This process involves the following. Number one, constriction of blood vessel. Two, formation of a temporary platelet plug. Activation of the coagulation cascade. Formation of the fibrin plug or the final clot. So normal hemostasis is the sequence of highly regulated processes that maintain blood in a fluid state in normal vessels yet also permits the rapid formation of a hemostatic clot at the site of vascular injury. Now before going into the detail of hemostasis, let's discuss little bit of platelets. Platelets are disc shaped enucleated cell fragments formed by megakaryocytes in the bone marrow circulate in the peripheral blood and their survival time is 8 to 10 days. About one third in the circulation are stored in the spleen. Now there are certain receptors on the platelets. Number one, glycoprotein receptors for von Willebrand factor which is GP1B and glycoprotein receptors for fibrinogen which is GP1B3A. Now role of platelets in normal hemostasis initially hemostatic plug is formed which seals blood vessel defects, provides a surface which recruits more platelets and concentrates active coagulation factors. Platelet factor 3, it is located on the platelet membrane. It is a phospholipid substrate required for the clotting sequence. Now the structure of platelets. Number one, contractile element called thrombosthenin and it helps in clot retraction. Dense bodies contain adenosine diphosphate which is ADP which is an aggregating agent then calcium which is a binding agent for vitamin K dependent factors. Then alpha granules contain one Willebrand factor fibrinogen and platelet factor 4 of course a heparin neutralizing factor. Response of platelets after vascular injury, adhesion and shape change. Now when the platelets are in contact with collagen and one Willebrand factor, 
that is adhesive glycoprotein von willebrand factor helps attachment of platelets to collagen association via gp1b receptors on platelets and von willebrand factor to collagen is necessary to overcome the high forces of flowing blood because it is a firm bond bleeding disorders deficiency of von willebrand factor is known as von willebrand disease gp1b receptor is known as bernard solier syndrome now release of substances take place soon after adhesion of platelets and they are calcium of dense bodies is important for coagulation adp of dense granules is important for platelet aggregation positively charged phospholipids appear on platelet surface binds calcium this becomes the site for aggregation of complex of various coagulation factors platelet function fill the gap between the endothelial cells in the blood vessels prevents leakage of rbcs into the interstitium platelet dysfunction causes leakage of rbcs producing petechi formation of hemostatic plug in the small blood vessel injury platelet derived growth factor stimulates smooth muscle hyperplasia now when there is injury there is platelet adhesion and this adhesion is as a result of exposure of subendothelial matrix causes activation of platelets which change shape and produce pseudopodia and rapidly adhere to the area via receptor sites which interacts with von willebrand factor von willebrand factor is a protein formed by endothelial cells and megakaryocytes it associates with a coagulation factor factor 8 in plasma then platelet aggregation platelet interact with each other via receptor sites which use fibrinogen as an intercellular bridge now it's very important to know that basically the initial shape of the platelets they are disk like structures whereas when they change their shape their surface area is increased so they can bind with each other via receptors platelet contract and release granules which contain pro aggregatory substances that promote the aggregation response these include adp 5 hydroxy tryptamine fibrinogen and von willebrand factor metabolism of arachidonic acid a fatty acid of the cell wall to which prostaglandin like metabolite that is thromboxin 
A2 also promotes aggregation and in addition vasoconstriction. Then fibrin regeneration. Exposure of the factor activates the extrinsic coagulation system. Thrombin generation augments the platelet activation and activated platelets provide phospholipid which is an essential cofactor at several points in the coagulation cascade. Now in this photograph you see that first there is injury, exposure of the extracellular matrix, there is von Willebrand factor, the platelet comes, the platelet change their shape, the platelet show adhesions and there is expression of receptor which is GP1B for the attachment to the exposed matrix. Then activation of the factor takes place via release of ADP, thromboxane A2 and more recruitment of platelet takes place and these platelets change their shape. And the last figure show that there is aggregation like fibrinogen and platelet receptors, they unite to form a primary platelet plug. Now formation of a hemostatic plug which is shown in this photograph. Number one is primary hemostasis. As you see that there is exposure of the extracellular matrix which is due to injury to the endothelium. The platelets come, they change their shape and they form aggregation and ultimately they engage fibrinogen to form a primary plug. More and more ADP is released and thromboxin A2 for the recruitment of more platelets. Whereas in the lower half there is secondary hemostasis which is due to the activation of the coagulation cascade resulting in the formation of fibrin plug. Now again major components of hemostasis, vascular injury, exposure of collagen, vasoconstriction of the vessel, platelet activation, release of von Willebrand factor and fibrinogen resulting in platelet plug leading to primary hemostasis and in the other half there is activation of the coagulation cascade formation of thrombin which converts fibrinogen into fibrin results in the formation of clot or stable plug which is called secondary hemostasis and this has to be kept under control by antithrombotic control mechanism which leads to fibrinolysis and clot degeneration. Now next topic is thrombus and thrombosis. Definition a thrombus is a solid mass of blood constituents formed within the vascular system during life and the process is called thrombosis. A thrombus is a solid mass formed from constituents 
of blood within the vascular system in the flowing blood and the process is called thrombosis this is an other way you can define it so the thrombus is formed by aggregate of coagulated blood containing fibrin platelets and entrapped cellular components of blood now this photograph shows the flow of blood the formed elements of the blood they are in the center that is rbcs wbcs platelets and they are in the central stream whereas the peripheral stream which is in contact with the endothelial cells is plasma this is called axial flow of blood now when this flow is disturbed the formed elements of the blood they come in contact with the endothelial cells of the blood vessel regarding the etiology there are three primary abnormalities which can lead to thrombus formation and constitute virkos trait number 1 injury to the endothelial lining of the vessel wall changes in the blood flow and hypercoagulability of blood now this photograph shows virkos trait that endothelial injury leads to abnormal flow and vice versa abnormal blood flow can lead to endothelial injury similarly abnormal blood flow may leads to hypercoagulation and endothelial injury also leads to hypercoagulability now endothelial injury may be physical or any disturbance in the balance of procoagulant and anti thrombotic effect of endothelium can influence local clotting events now coming back to abnormal blood flow there can be turbulence or stasis which disrupts laminar flow prevents dilution of activated factors retard inflow of inhibitors of coagulation and endothelial activation now we will briefly discuss turbulence and stasis they occur in thrombosis in which the normal axial flow of blood is disturbed when blood slows down the blood cells including platelets marginate to the periphery and form a kind of pavement close to endothelium which is known as margination and pavementing stasis allow a higher release of oxygen from the blood turbulence actually injure the endothelium resulting in the deposition of platelets and fibrin formation of arterial and cardiac thrombi is facilitated by turbulence in the blood flow while stasis initiates the venous thrombi even without evidence of endothelial injury 
hypercoagulability, the occurrence of thrombus or the phenomenon of thrombosis in some conditions such as in nephrotic syndrome, advanced cancers, extensive trauma, burns during purpurium can be explained on the basis of hypercoagulability of blood. The effect of hypercoagulability of blood on thrombosis is favored by advancing age, smoking, use of oral contraceptive and obesity. Hypercoagulability may occur by the following changes in the composition of blood. Increase in coagulation factors, for example, fibrinogen, prothrombin, factor 7a, factor 8a and 10a. Increase in platelet count and their adhesiveness. Decrease level of coagulation inhibitors, for example, antithrombin 3 and fibrin split products. Hypercoagulable conditions may be genetic or primary or they can be secondary. First, we will go for genetic or primary, that is mutation in factor 5, deficiency of antithrombin 3, deficiency of protein C, deficiency of protein S, fibrinolysis defects, hyperhomocysteinemia, allelic variations in prothrombin levels. Now the acquired causes which leads to hypercoagulable state includes prolonged bed rest, prolonged immobilization, tissue damage due to fractures, burns, surgery, late pregnancy and purpurium, malignant tumors, DIC, smoking, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, myocardial infarction, prosthetic cardiac valves, hyperhomocysteinemia, polycythemia, dehydration, nephrotic syndrome, and certain drugs which are used during anesthesia or also oral contraceptive pills. Now there are conditions which are associated with both arterial and venous thrombi like hyperhomocysteinemia, homocysteinuria, disseminated intravascular coagulation which is DIC, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, heparin induced thrombocytopenia, essential thrombocythemia, malignancies, PNH, polycythemia vera, dysfibrinogenemia. Morphological features, thrombosis may occur in the heart, arteries, veins and capillaries. Arterial thrombi produce ischemia and infarction, whereas cardiac and venous thrombi can cause embolism. Types of thrombus may be arterial thrombus, venous thrombus, also called phlebothrombosis. 
no arterial thrombi they grow in retrograde direction from the point of attachment they have got line of zan these are red and white alternate lines and this is due to the presence of platelets mural thrombi which are present in the chamber of the heart occlusive which is seen in coronary cerebral and femoral arteries venous thrombi static environment is important extend in the direction of blood flow they are red in color and hard defined line of zan firm and shows a point of attachment more commonly seen in lower extremities thrombi may form on heart valves and that is seen in infective endocarditis rheumatic endocarditis non bacterial thrombotic endocarditis and migratory thrombophlebitis no cardiac thrombi are present in any chamber of the heart and on the valve cusps common in the atrial appendages especially of the right atrium and on the mitral and aortic valves called vegetations seen in infective endocarditis and non bacterial thrombotic endocarditis cardiac thrombi are mural that is non occlusive and are the mural thrombi encountered in aorta in atherosclerosis and in aneurysmal dilatation rarely large round thrombus may form and obstruct the mitral valve and is called ball valve thrombus agonal thrombi are formed shortly before death and may occur in either or both the ventricles they are composed mainly of fibrin now in this photograph you can appreciate mural thrombi can be seen in the left ventricle secondary to infarction of the left ventricular wall now in this photograph you can see that thrombi on the heart valves in infective endocarditis they are large mixed friable and contain microorganisms thrombi can occur on heart valves in rheumatic endocarditis this photograph shows occlusion of the branch of coronary artery arterial thrombi they are seen in in aorta due to aneurysm or arteritis coronary arteries due to atherosclerosis mesenteric artery due to atherosclerosis and arteritis arteries of the limbs atherosclerosis diabetes mellitus burgers disease renaults phenomenon renal artery atherosclerosis arteritis cerebral artery that is atherosclerosis and vasculitis venous thrombi veins of the lower limbs that is deep veins of the legs like varicose veins 
popliteal femoral and iliac veins that is seen in post operative stage or in post partum then pulmonary veins in congestive cardiac failure pulmonary hypertension hepatic and portal vein in portal hypertension superior vena cava infections in head and neck inferior vena cava extension of the thrombus from hepatic vein mesenteric veins valvulus intestinal obstruction renal vein in renal amyloidosis capillary thrombi they are minute thrombi composed of packed red cells which are formed in the capillaries in acute inflammatory lesions vasculitis and in disseminated intravascular coagulation now this is the chart which i have taken from walter and israel general pathology phlebothrombosis and thrombophlebitis the differences major causes stasis in thrombophlebitis inflammation of the vein wall size of the primary thrombus small in thrombophlebitis larger depending upon the extent of phlebitis size of propagated clot long and often poorly anchored it is non if present short and well anchored emboli common and massive but they are sterile in phlebothrombosis whereas in thrombophlebitis they are rare in infective cases sight usually cough veins in thrombophlebitis it is anywhere and clinical picture in phlebothrombosis is silent whereas in thrombophlebitis pain and signs of inflammation now fate of thrombus it is very important it may remains attached or it may undergo lysis it may undergo retraction due to recanalization it may propagate it may undergo organization due to hyalinization calcification ossification it may become infected or it may uninfected and leading to emboli if they are detached resulting in infected emboli or bland emboli now this photograph shows the previous all features which i have discussed with you then comes thrombophilia thrombophilia a hyper coagulable state is a inheritable or acquired disorder of the hemostatic mechanism predisposing to thrombosis typically venous due to imbalance between coagulant proteins and anti coagulant proteins in the blood now risk factors which are environmental or inevitable risk factors like increasing age pregnancy immobility due to long flights dehydration and then thrombophilia 
may be arterial which is due to smoking hypertension atherosclerosis hyperlipidemia diabetes mellitus venous due to surgery or trauma malignancy pregnancy use of oral contraceptives hormone replacement therapy chronic inflammatory bowel disease and pnh now there are certain risk factors which are disease related antiphospholipid syndrome malignancies inflammatory states hematological diseases and then intravenous drug abuse post operative factors immobilization indwelling venous devices pharmacological agents like use of oral contraceptives tamoxifen chemotherapy no screening of thrombophilia like performing of prothrombin time aptt thrombin time anti thrombin activity estimation of protein c estimation of protein s inherited thrombophilia we can go for anti thrombin 3 deficiency protein c deficiency protein s deficiency activated protein c resistance and then factor 5 laden hyper homocysteinemia elevated factor 8 9 and 11 now this chart i have taken from your book gold gen to differentiate between anti mortem thrombus and post mortem clots the gross features which are seen in anti mortem thrombus it is dry granular firm and friable whereas post mortem clots gelatinous soft and rubbery relation to vessel wall adherent to the vessel wall whereas post mortem clots weakly attached to the vessel wall shape may or may not fit their vascular contours that is the anti mortem thrombus whereas post mortem clot take the shape of the vessel or its bifurcation microscopic features the surface contains apparent line of zan whereas in post mortem clots the surface is chicken fat yellow covering the underlying red current jelly gentlemen i have discussed the subject briefly with you if you have got any questions please feel free to write in the comment box and inshallah i'll answer them